Good afternoon. These weird noises that you may hear as uh, we go along are part of our scenery. They go to make up the aloha spirit of Hawaii, whether they're airplanes overhead, lawn mowers, or birds, or beasts. So take them in good stride, as we are doing here. And now we are in Lausanne, Switzerland, for the 1962 special class. Real one, side one. And the subject is I, God. There are two things to notice about these meditations. Or rather, there are two stages of the meditations. You will notice that in the beginning of your meditation, there is a possibility that you will think thoughts that you will think about God or that you will think about truth and even think about meditation. This is a preliminary step and only that because the meditation does not take place while you are thinking truth or thinking about God. The meditation only takes place when you are still and when you are listening. It is then that the very Spirit of God enters into our experience. Let us review for just a moment. God is Spirit. The Kingdom of God is within you. This means that the Spirit, the actual Spirit of God, is within you. Now up to this moment, this is nothing more than an intellectual statement of truth. It has absolutely no power. It has no spiritual power whatsoever. No healing power, no saving power, no forgiving power. Because it is merely a statement made with the mind. A statement of truth, but nevertheless one made with the mind. That God is spirit and that the spirit is within you. But now, after you know this truth, you give truth the opportunity to make you free. This is where the second stage comes into our experience. When, having made our declaration that God is spirit, and that spirit is within me, and that the nature of spirit is omniscience, the all-knowing mind, the all-knowing intelligence, the nature of spirit is omnipotence, the all-power, the nature of spirit is omnipresence. Here where I am, within me, in fact, within and without, above and below, filling all space, this is now my declaration of truth. If I now am still, so as to listen for the still small voice, and ultimately receive within me an impartation of the spirit, then I can truthfully say, I live, yet not I. Christ liveth my life. Or I can say with the Master, the Father within me doeth the works. However, too many students on the spiritual and metaphysical path believe that reading these words of truth or speaking them or hearing them constitutes spiritual living. And this is not true. This is only a preparation for spiritual living. There must come to you, to every individual at some time in his experience, the actual presence of God. Not a statement about the presence of God, but the actual presence itself. Then and only then have you entered the spiritual life. Until that takes place, you are the natural man who Paul says is not under the law of God, neither indeed can be. You are the creature who is not governed by God. You are the man of earth who has nothing at all in God and receives nothing from God. It is only when truth has become known to you, the truth that the God you are seeking is already within you, the truth that the nature of this God is omniscience, all-knowing, omnipotence, all-power, omnipresence, always present, 
When you know this and declare it and live with it day after day after day, reminding yourself of it, and at the same time developing the listening ear that eventually something happens. A stirring takes place within you, a feeling, a sensing, an awareness. And all of a sudden you feel, ah, this is it. This is the presence. Whereas before I was blind, now I see. Now this spirit which has always been within you has come alive. It is this Christ, or Son of God, that is hidden in man, buried in man, buried under 4,000 years of our ignoring, that has now come to life. In the beginning, God, just using Bible language, breathed his breath of life into us. This really means that God's life became our life. Therefore, we have no life of our own. The only life we have is God, but this has been hidden for 4,000 years so that we believe that we have a life, and God is life, and if we could only get the two together, that we would have peace on earth and happiness and health and abundance. But you never can get the two together, for there is only one. What you can do is realize that this life which you are living is God. That you can do. You can stop believing that this life you are living was born on a certain date and is inevitably doomed to end on a certain date. You can surrender that belief and accept the truth of your immortality. Not immortality after you die. That is merely the continuity of life. But immortality before you are born immortality while you are on earth, immortality when you leave here. This you can accept. You cannot make it so, because it is so. God is your life. The kingdom of God is within you. You cannot make it so. You do not make it so by becoming good, or by becoming spiritual, or by becoming a true student. You merely discover that which has been eternally true. This life which is your life is really then the presence of God. Mark that. This life which is your life is the presence of God. The presence of God in you is God life individually living as you. God living as you. I live yet not I. Christ liveth as me. This presence has a name. Also one that except for a few brief times in the history of the world has been hidden from the world. And for what seems to be a good reason, man's inability to accept it, man's inability to grasp it. Evidently that time has gone by because there are many now able to receive the name of God and to live through that name. If you will notice, when God spoke through Jesus, now I call your attention to that sentence. If you will notice, when God spoke through Jesus, he always used his name so that you would have the true identity and authority. And you would not be believing that it was just a man talking or a Hebrew rabbi. Because at that time the master was a Hebrew rabbi robed in the robe of the synagogue and often speaking from the platform of the synagogue or temple. But so that you might know that it really was not a man or a rabbi speaking, that it was God, God always voiced his message by announcing his name. You will notice that this is the way God spoke through Jesus to the disciples and to those who gathered to speak to him. I am come that you might have life and that you might have life more abundant. 
Did you ever think this was Jesus talking? No, Jesus announced that someday he would leave. But he said, I will never leave thee. So it is I who says to you, I am come that you might have life, and that you might have life more abundant. This is God speaking, not a man. Because Jesus said, I can of my own self do nothing. If I speak of myself, I bear witness to a lie. Therefore, whenever he says, I, it is God the Father speaking through the Son, and the Father always announces himself, so that you will make no mistake that it is God speaking, I am come. And remember, life can only come forth from God. If you have ever believed otherwise, if you have believed that your life came from your parents, this is a good time to examine yourself and see whether you believe that there are two sources of life. There is only one source of your life, and this is God. And I am come. I, God, am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundant. Before Abraham was, I am with you. Before Jesus was born, before Abraham was born, before Moses was born, I, God, am with you, within you. This is not only a reference to the past, but I, God, will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will be with thee to the end of the world within thee. I, God, am thy bread, thy meat, thy wine, thy water. I, God, am the resurrection and the life. You will discover that as you attain meditation and come to the place of hearing the still small voice, that very often it will speak to you audibly or inaudibly, and usually the word I will be there. Sometimes it will say, Fear not. I am with you. And you will know that it is God speaking. That God is declaring himself. Fear not. I am with you. I go before you to make the crooked places straight. In the same way when Jesus says, I and the Father are one, is he not saying that the life of Jesus and the life of God is one and the same life? And he is speaking of your Father and my Father... Therefore, your father and my father is that one life. The one and only life which will always announce itself to the listening ear and always as an authority so that you may know that it is God speaking. It will announce itself with the name I. Fear not, I am with you. Fear not, my presence goes before you. My peace give I unto thee. My kingdom is ever established within thee. It is always I, or it is always me, or it is always my. And when you hear these words, it is God speaking through his authority, the authority of the name, so that you may make no mistake. All of this brings you back to the fact that this kingdom is within you. And if you are to experience harmony, it will have to flow from within you to your outer experience. The world has been seeking it outside of itself. Man has been seeking peace, harmony, wholeness, completeness, somewhere outside of his own being. Some have sought it in holy mountains and some have sought it in holy temples. Some have sought it in a God up in the sky. Some have sought it in a man on a crucifix. But they all missed the way because the kingdom of God is within you. Closer to you than breathing, nearer than hands and feet. And you will not begin to enjoy this kingdom as long as you are looking for it outside. You will only begin to experience it when you let it flow out from within you. 
It is the bread that you cast on the water that returns to you. There is no bread outside that someone else has that they can give you. Yes, each one of us can be a help to each other at some period or other of our journey, but that is only a help to reach the center of our being, where our meat is hidden. Our wine, our water, our resurrection, our life, our good, our supply, our companionship. In other words, whatever it is we are seeking, it is already embodied within ourselves. That is why the mystical poet wrote that we must open out a way for the imprisoned splendor to escape, rather than make entry for the life supposed to be without. We must open out a way. If we would have companionship, instead of seeking companions, we must seek to express companionship. If we would have supply, instead of praying for it to come in, we must start giving it out. Whatever it is we are seeking, we must long to loose from within ourselves. This brings us to the question of how. How is all of this accomplished? First of all, we must understand that we have a mind, but that that is not a good mind nor an evil mind. It is an unconditioned mind. This is one of the first steps to understand that it is your mind in the long run that is going to be a transparency revealing your life. Now you have a mind. It was given to you in the beginning as an instrument through which you are to live just as you were given a body. You were given a mind and a body. The body also is unconditioned. You do not have a good body or a bad body. You do not have a moral body or an immoral body. You do not have a healthy body or a sick body. You merely have a body that has no qualities. Now whatever your body gives back to you of sickness or health is merely the transparency of what is taking place in your mind. It is either truth being fed to your mind and producing an harmonious body, or it is ignorance and error being fed to the mind and producing discord. But start with this, that your body of itself is neither sick nor well and cannot be. It is nothing but a vehicle or an instrument that has no qualities of its own. The mind, likewise, is yours. The mind also has no qualities of good and evil, as you know by your baby's mind. It has no qualities of good or evil. It merely begins to take on the transparency of what it's fed around it, first by the family and then by the teachers and then by the newspapers. The first thing you know, the mind of the baby is the mind of an adult, That is a transparency for whatever is fed to it, in its ignorance. The mind likewise is yours, and the mind also has no qualities of good and evil. There are no divine minds, and there are no mortal minds. There is only one mind, and it is neither good nor evil. It has no qualities whatsoever. Now, in addition to your body and your mind, there is you. There is the you that has a mind and a body. This is the important part that you play. What are you feeding into your mind? Are you feeding it the truth that I and the Father are one and all that the Father has is mine? Are you feeding it the truth that God is spirit? I am spirit. And even my body is the temple of God? Are you feeding it the truth that I embody within myself the meat, the wine, the water, the resurrection, the life eternal? Are you feeding into your mind the great revealed truth that the kingdom of God is within you, that God is spirit, that this spirit is within you, closer than breathing? Are you feeding into your mind the truth that I in the midst of you will never leave you nor forsake you? that I in the midst of you am your life, your life eternal, your immortal life? Are you feeding into the mind the truth that you are immortal, 
since I and the Father are one, and I the Father and I the Son are one, thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me, for I and the Father are one. Are you feeding into the mind this truth? Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Hear that word again. I, all that I, God, have is thine. Are we feeding that into the mind? Then the mind, which has no power of its own, is a transparency for the truth that we have fed into the mind. Now the body reflects all of this truth that we have fed into the mind. Truth goes into the mind through the divine consciousness, the life which I am. The mind then feeds the body, and the body begins to reflect all that we have fed the mind. It will be interesting here to remember that Dr. Von Braun has revealed in a public writing, a newspaper writing, that they have now discovered that mind is the substance of the body, the substance of matter. So therefore, whatever mind the substance is, the body substance must be. So it is not only spiritually revealed, but now materially accepted. Mind is the substance of matter. Therefore you will know that what you feed into the mind becomes evident as the condition of matter. Actually, mind is the substance of the body, and that is why whatever we feed into the mind becomes manifest as body, as condition of body. As against this, there are the universal beliefs which constitute the human experience based on a belief in two powers, good and evil. Universal belief says that you were born on a certain day, and probably if you are fortunate, that you will improve until you are 30, and then you will start to deteriorate naturally. And a doctor told someone recently that has just written me, well, you know you are past 50, so you must expect to be going downhill now. <clears throat> well, these are the universal beliefs that are being fed into your mind. Whether you are conscious of it or not has nothing to do with it. They are being fed into you. It is being fed into you that it is natural to deteriorate that it is natural not to respond to food or climate or weather harmoniously. It is natural for weather to affect you adversely or climate. Ah, yes, this is all being fed into our minds, not only by the invisible antenna that we carry, by the things we read, the things we hear. All of this is untruth or ignorance being fed into the mind and then the body must reflect it. The body must show forth what is fed into the mind because the mind of itself is neither good nor evil, therefore mind shows forth whatever it is that is fed to it. And it doesn't take you one minute to think of what would happen to your mind or body if you fed into it all of the pornographic literature that's going around. Then think of what the condition of your mind and body would be, and then you will understand why the mind and body of others is what it is. Not because mind is evil, not because body is diseased, because the food that is being fed the mind and body is diseased. It is for this reason that as you come to truth, you will discover why the Master did not say the truth will make you free, but why he did say he shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. He shall know the truth you must know the truth. This truth embodied in your consciousness becomes the law unto your body. Or the universal beliefs of this world pouring into your mind becomes the laws unto your body. And therefore it comes to us, choose ye this day whom you will serve. Truth or mammon. Choose what you are going to permit into your mind. This you that I am talking about is really divine consciousness. Since you are the life of God, or God is the life of you, since God is your consciousness, 
God is your soul, God is your spirit, this you is infinite. Think. This you is infinite. I and my Father are one. This means that the allness of God is embodied in the consciousness which you are. If you understand this oneness of God and your individual being, if you understand what it means, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine, you will understand that the hidden splendor, the all good of life, is embodied within you. I have hidden manna. I have meet the world knows not of. God gave man dominion in the beginning over everything, all dominion. Therefore, you have in your consciousness the infinite supply of God. You have immortal life. You have divine dominion. You have in you the multiplier of loaves and fishes. It is within your own consciousness. The allness of God is present fully in you. When you grasp this, you immediately stop looking to this outside world for anything. And you begin to let it flow from within you. This brings us to the great lesson of supply taught by the Hebrew master embodied in one passage. What have you in your house? You know, the only way you can understand this lesson is if you remember that that remark was made to a penniless widow who was about to lose her son into slavery because she had no money. How terrible it must have sounded to hear a great prophet say, what have you in your house? But you see, the lesson that came forth was, and she finally had to acknowledge it, that she did have a few drops of oil and a little meal. Here you have the basis or the secret of the supply of everything. Health, wealth, harmony, happiness, everything. When you ask yourself the question, not what can I get, who can I get it from, where shall I get it, or how do I know it will be here on time? But when you ask yourself, what have I in my house? There is no use of running around the house looking to see what you have. Because that is not your house, that is your residence. Your house is your consciousness. What do you have in your consciousness? Well, because God is your consciousness, you will discover that you are the temple of God. So your house is the temple of God. Now what have you got in it? You have love. You have life. You have forgiveness. You have patience. You have justice. Charity. Benevolence. Oh, you have so many things in your house. Yes, you may even, like the widow, discover that you have a dress to give away or a suit or a pair of shoes. There may even be a few drops of oil and a little meal. But that is not the important thing. The important thing is, what have you in your house? What have you that you can let flow? Because we are thinking of God as a spirit and man as spiritual, so we do not care what you have materially. What have you in your household, in your consciousness? The moment you ask yourself that question, you have the answer to all your supply. Because now you will understand why Jesus could say, it profiteth you nothing to pray for your friend. Certainly not. You are not expressing divine love when you pray for your friends. That is just a little bit of selfishness. Of course, the friends are around you. You want them to be healthy and wealthy. It makes it more comfortable for you and me if all of our friends and relatives are happy and healthy. That is not manifesting divine love. Manifesting divine love is when we pray for our enemies. Manifesting divine love is when we pray for those who persecute us and despitefully use us. When we can pray, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Open their eyes that they may see this way of heaven, this way of God, the way of love. When you can pray, Father, forgive all of the enemies on earth. Reform them, redeem them, open their eyes to the Christ, to the Spirit of God and man, but never punish them. When you can do this, this divine love that is within you is now flowing out of you and you will find that love really is the secret of life. Not love that comes to you, this is not the secret of life, but the love that flows out from you. 
The love that comes to you is blessing the ones that send it out to you. But the only love that will ever bless you is the love that you send out. And the love can be in form of forgiveness, prayers, benevolence, justice, 70 times 7 forgiveness. Whatever measure of spiritual qualities flow out from you is the measure of the bread that comes back to you on the waters. Do you see then that as long as you are the natural man praying only for your friends, as long as you are the natural man thinking in terms of incoming, you are not under the law of God. You are not receiving the things of God. It is only when you are the spiritual child of God that you are receiving the things of God. And according to the Master, you are a child of God when you begin to pray for your enemies. When you are the natural man, it is absolute folly to say that you are infinite and that you have infinite supply to share because you have not. You are barren. Of yourself you have nothing and you are receiving nothing from God. It is only when through your ability to be still within and feel this presence, this I that is within you, it is only then that you can begin to understand not only that you are infinite, but you have infinity to share, to give, to bestow, without looking for any return. It is the awareness of this presence within that does the work. It is not the declaration that the presence is within. The declaration is only the first step that leads us to listen. Until somebody makes us aware of the fact that that which we are seeking is within our own being, naturally we cannot take time to sit back and listen. We do not even know what we are listening to or for. But after we have been instructed that the kingdom of God is within you, then it is up to us to give whatever measure of time or effort is necessary until we develop such a listening ear that eventually we hear that still small voice saying, Peace, be still, I am with you. Fear not, I am with you. Then there can be a relaxing and letting this I that is within you take over. And eventually you also can say, it is the Father within me that is doing the works, or it is the Christ that dwelleth in me that goes before me to make the crooked places straight. Or, I can do all things through this Son of God that dwelleth in me. Because now you have the actual, alive presence. Always try to see the difference between having that alive presence and merely making statements about it. See the difference between just affirming these things and experiencing these things. Because the affirming of them is of no value except as we use it as a first step leading to the actual experience of this presence that is within you and me. Then remember, when I, Joel, my individual selfhood, when I feed into my mind this truth that the kingdom of God is within me, the kingdom of allness is within me, that God's allness and God's presence is within me, that I am spiritually created, spiritually maintained, spiritually fed, spiritually healed, spiritually clothed, when I feed this into my mind, I bring to myself an inner peace. And then, of course, the mind reflects back what I have fed into it. It gives back exactly the measure that I have given unto it because if it, it, because of itself, the mind is neither good nor bad. That is one of the reasons that we have great success in helping mental cases because we do not start from any premise that the person has a diseased mind. As a matter of fact, they cannot have a diseased mind. It is an impossibility. Mind has no qualities. Mind is an unconditioned instrument. And to those who are mentally unbalanced, it merely means that they have been fed ignorance, superstition, and fear. And now all that is necessary is to empty some of that out and pour in some of the truth, and then it will be found that their mind is just as normal as anybody else's mind, only now it is giving back that which is being fed into it. If you want a proof of this, if you ever need a proof of this, 
ask some old-time doctor if this isn't true. That 50 years ago, mental institutes were filled with women who were suffering from menopause and lost their mind. Now, no, one, no woman is a mental institute suffering from insanity due to menopause. Why? Because the doctors no longer believe it and they no longer feed that into the human mind. And therefore, the women don't respond to it. Now, their minds never were insane. They were merely fed that poisoned belief. And the moment menopause was going to come near them, they began to fear it. And it's no wonder that many of them did end up in a mental institute fearing it so. Now, today, when women are being instructed in the fact that menopause is a physical thing and has no power over the mind whatsoever, or there may be periods of nervousness or something of that kind due to the physiological changes, but that's all. Now the mind of women doesn't respond and they don't have to go to mental institutes. Do you see what I mean by the fact that the mind is not diseased? It merely reflects what is poured into it. That brings us, of course, to the logical next point. The ignorance, the superstition, and the fear that is fed into the human mind has power only as long as there is the universal belief in two powers. In other words, if a person never came in contact with a truth teaching, then all of the ignorance, sin, fear, superstition, paganism that is fed into that mind would keep right on being an evil power unto it. It is only when evil in any form or any nature comes into the experience of a spiritual student grounded in God as one power, the only power, that you then find the evil in mind is dissipated. Because in and of itself, evil is not a power. Evil is really of the same nature as darkness. Darkness is neither a presence nor a power. When light comes, it does not chase darkness any place because there is no darkness to be chased. So it is when an individual comes into contact with error, evil in any form, when an individual spiritually endowed, that is, with an understanding of one power, comes into the presence of evil in any form, the evil disappears in the same way darkness does. Not that it is healed, not that it goes anywhere, but that it never was an it. It only existed as a belief, not a thing. When two times two is five comes in contact with two times two is four, five does not go anywhere. Because there was no five there. There was merely a belief which had no externalized existence. It had no externalized form. Whether then a person comes to us with a mental disability or a physical disability, it represents a belief in two powers. That is all that any evil is. It doesn't make any difference whether it is a simple cold or a multiple cancer. All that it is is a belief in two powers. And it is not the belief of your patient. It is a universal belief. It has nothing to do with your patient except that at this moment your patient happens to believe in it. But actually it is not their belief, it is a universal belief. When this is brought to the consciousness of an individual who has perceived that the nature of God is spirit, then what power has matter? The nature of God is truth. What power has error? You must always understand that when you are speaking of God, you are speaking of infinity. Therefore, when you are speaking of power of God, you are speaking of the infinity of good. Not a great good and a little evil, but an infinity and an allness of good. Therefore, the moment that you accept and begin to feed into your mind that God is spirit, and therefore all power is spiritual power, you have nullified the belief in material and mental powers, and you discover that these material and mental powers are not powers. 
There was a time in most of the metaphysical movements, and at the present time it still exists in some, the belief that there are mental powers and that mind is power. This is pure illusion. There is no more power in the mind than there is in matter. Mind is an unconditioned instrument, just like matter is an unconditioned instrument, and mind and matter is really one. Matter is form, and mind is the essence or substance, and they are one. But neither one has power. Neither one has qualities or of, of good or of evil. The only qualities of good are embodied in the I that I am. And there are no qualities of evil anywhere. The whole theory of evil is nothing but a belief in a self put apart from God. A belief in a power apart from God. A belief in a substance apart from God. And always it is a universal belief symbolized by the mythical characters of Adam and Eve representing mankind. So when you think of Adam and Eve, you are thinking of the symbols of mankind and therefore the universal nature of these Adamic or earthly beliefs. Just think who you are. I and my father are one. And all of the truth that the father hath is mine. Therefore one with God is a majority. Ten righteous men in a city could save the city. This means that I, as I feed into my mind and body the truth that God has given me dominion, that the Spirit of God dwells in me and that the function of the Spirit of God in me is to be a light dispelling darkness, truth dispelling the appearance of error, then any phase of error that touches my consciousness that is brought to my attention must fade and dissolve. Not by virtue of my doing anything. Not by virtue of my thinking anything. But by virtue of what I know and which I do not have to declare every time I see error. I do not have to declare two times two or four every time I see two times two or five. I can just smile at it. And mean the same thing as if I rehearsed two times two or four. So it is that every time I become aware of error, I do not have to go through the form of saying, you are a liar, Satan, get thee behind me. Because that is so embodied in my consciousness that it is automatic. But until we reach that estate, we must consciously feed into our minds every bit of truth that we can find. Every drop of truth that is important must come to us so that we can feed it into the mind which is at the same time feeding the body. Probably it would be helpful to understand the meaning of mind and matter as one. Let me illustrate that with this paper box. The substance of this box is paper. The form or shape of it is box. But there is no way to separate the paper and the box. Because there is not paper and box, there is paper formed as box. And so we have had it in previous classes with the tumbler. Glass is the substance. Tumbler is the form but glass and tumbler is one, and whatever the substance of the glass, that is the nature of the tumbler. Mind is the substance of form. Mind is the substance of which your body is made. Mind is the substance of which your business is made. Mind is the substance of which your home is made. Mind is the substance of everything that exists, and the form is merely the form appearing sometimes as stone, sometimes as wood, sometimes as flesh, but always mind. Just like sound is always nothing more or less than a wave. But a wave that can sometimes be soprano and sometimes can be ba bass, but still only waves, high or low, thick or thin, still just waves. So it is mind is the substance of form. It may appear as leather, it may appear as paper, it may appear as human flesh, but always mind is the substance. And please remember that neither mind nor form have qualities. You impart the qualities to your mind and body by what you feed the mind. 
choose ye this day whom you will serve. Feed your mind with spiritual truth, and your mind will show forth harmony as body. Let your mind just receive these airwaves of ignorance, superstition, fear, theories, beliefs, and the body will respond to these. It becomes important that you yourself realize that there is someone called me or you, Joel, Mary, William, Henry. There is someone, there is an individual, and I am an individual. And you have to make that assertion too. I am an individual. I am an individual. God expressing himself as individual me. God expressing himself in an individual way. I am that. Then when you have assumed that dominion, you can say, I shall feed my mind and body. Not my mind and body will talk to me. I will talk to my mind and body. And I will talk to them in terms of food. I will feed them spiritual truth. Then my outer, in my outer life, I will act as knowing that I and the Father are one and that all the Father hath is mine. And I will always seek in what ways I can give, share, unburden, let out. I suppose in a way it is selfish, knowing that it is going to come back. But nevertheless, the point is that there is no way for good to reach us from the outside. Even the love of our parents and best friends wears out if we are continually on the receiving end. It is only as we are on the pouring end that we become loved. Fortunately, it does not mean that we must always be pouring money because we are spiritual beings, really, and money is only one of the lesser things that we have to share. The greatest things we have to share are the spiritual values. Like the poem that was written many years ago, the greatest things in life are free. Love, forgiveness, justice, gratitude, sharing, cooperating, all of these things are free. We all have an abundance an infinity of them to pour forth. And as we do, we really discover that we are infinite in nature, and we were just victims of the belief that we were poor mortals, conceived in iniquity and brought forth in sin. What a horrible thing this is, when you stop to think that the Master revealed that you should call no man on earth your father. There is only one parent. We are immaculately conceived for that reason, because we have only one parent. It is God the Father that has sent everything into expression, whether it sent us into expression first as a seed and then a form has nothing to do with it. It was God that sent forth all that is an expression and everything that was sent forth is and always retains the nature of God. But... This must be added to this message because the message is left incomplete until this is added. In the beginning of your spiritual life, you feed into your mind the truth of spiritual literature, the truth of these specific principles of the infinite way, and especially these specific truths of the infinite way. You feed them into your mind, you live with them, and those Bible passages that uh, constitute so much a part of this message. But remember this, that while you are doing this, you must always remember that this is only a footstep you must very soon begin to start with one period a day and turn within and say, Father, you feed me with the truth that hasn't heretofore been known. There is more truth in God consciousness that has never been revealed than that has been revealed in 4,000 years. Now go within and ask to be fed from within. You really are only being half-fed when you are fed with the truth of Scripture or my writings. You are being half-fed. At least it is pure food. 
But you're only half fed. You are only beginning to be fully fed when you can go within to your inner consciousness and say, Father, you gave all those truths to Joel. How about me? I am not a stepchild. Yes, if he could go within and receive these truths that are startling the world today, and God is no respecter of persons, feed me. And then you will find that God will reveal himself to you, feed you with the meat and the wine and the water of which the Master spoke. You'll be surprised that many times it will be in the same words Jesus used or the same words Joel used, uh, but with a whole new meaning and a whole new substance and with a whole new power. And other times, it won't be in words. It will be God feeding you himself, his own very blood and body, his own very consciousness and being. And the only way you'll know it is that is you'll feel this tremendous uplift and you'll feel strength in your body or in your mind and then when you go forth into your activities, you'll find yourself with uh, information you never had, premonitions or intuitions, inspirations, new principles. It might be new principles in engineering. It might be new principles of art or literature. It may be new principles of language. It may be new principles of music. You will be fed from within because it is only half the message of the infinite way to feed you with the truth that have been revealed to me, Joel, as a preparation to where you can be fed directly from within yourself. It is only then that you can truthfully say, I live in God. God lives in me, or Christ liveth my life. You can't say that while you are living on outer food. You can't even say it fully while you're living on other people's truth. You can only fully say it when you know that the Spirit of God indwells you and is flowing and is inspiring you and teaching you and strengthening you well, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> when you start to be more loving to the world than you are now, and you recognize the fact that this can't be me, this really can't, the Spirit of God is loving through me. Or when you find that you are more forgiving than you ever were, and you say, this can't be me. This must be God forgiving through me. then you will know that you are being fed from within and you will come really to the passages that have made up uh, my personal demonstration. I have hidden manna. I have meat the world knows not of. And it is that hidden manna and that meat that is flowing forth as this message and all that has carried the, world around, the message around the world and raised up publishers and all the rest. It is that hidden manna. It is the meat the world knows not of. And all I'm talking about, it is the indwelling presence of God which is there. It is there, and it has been there since late 1928, consciously realized. In all of us, it is there and has been since before Abraham was, but it will not feed you, support you, sustain you, or live you until you become consciously aware of its presence. And this is the function of the message of the infinite way, to lead you to the experience. Thank you.